This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944 8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. Vsh.org. Welcome, everyone, to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We thank you for coming. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting animal rights, human health, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. It's the largest regional vegetarian society in the country with over 1,800 members. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to welcome back to Hawaii Dr. Michael Greger. This is Dr. Greger's third visit to Hawaii in the past few years from his home in Boston, and he's developed a new topic for us tonight entitled Stopping Cancer Before It Starts. He will also be speaking at UH Manoa tomorrow at noon in the Art Building Auditorium. That talk is co-sponsored by the Vegetarian Club of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and his topic will be Going Vegetarian. Dr. Greger is a nationally recognized speaker on a number of important public health and social justice issues. He's been invited to lecture at countless universities, medical schools, and conferences around the world, including the Conference on World Affairs, Based in Boston, he's a general practitioner specializing in clinical nutrition and is a founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He's the author of Carbophobia, The Scary Truth About America's Low-Carb Craze, and Heart Failure, Diary of a Third-Year Medical Student. He's contributed to a number of other books on nutrition and safety issues as well. Most of these books and some others, including CDs, are available for sale at the table over by the windows also. Dr. Greger is a graduate of the Cornell University School of Agriculture and the Tufts University School of Medicine. Now please welcome Dr. Michael Greger. How many people in this room personally know someone that died of cancer? Look around the room. We have got to stop this. A million people in this country are diagnosed with cancer every year and a thousand die every day. It is almost as if a single World Trade Center tower were collapsing on our society every single day. We have got to stop this. Prostate cancer rates are rising every single year. All childhood cancer rising. Breast cancer rates rising every single year. In fact, cancer death rates are set to explode worldwide, according to the World Health Organization, thanks in part to our corporations exporting cigarettes and our diet around to the rest of the world. Look at that slide. One out of every three women in this room are going to one day be sitting in a doctor's office, and the doctor is going to come back in the room with a sad look on her face. She's going to stare down at the floor. She's going to say, I'm really sorry, but it's cancer. Imagine how you're going to feel on that day. One out of every two of men in this room are going to have the same experience, being diagnosed with cancer sometime within your lifetime. We've spent $200 billion on the war on cancer, yet overall cancer death rates haven't changed in 50 years. We have lost the war on cancer. We need peace. We need prevention. 
Cancer forms in four steps and we can block them all. All cancer starts with one cell. We have 75 trillion cells in our body and all cancer starts when one of those cells is exposed to a carcinogen. A carcinogen that mutates its chromosomes, mutates its DNA, turning it into a cancer cell. This is actually a photomicrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope of an actual cancer cell. Cancer cell which can then divide like crazy into a tumor, a tumor which can kill you or your friends or your family, but we can stop it. Step one. A carcinogen comes in contact with one of our cells. How might we prevent that step? Well, we can reduce our exposure to carcinogens within our environment. Okay. So, what are some common carcinogens? Anyone? Tobacco smoke. Fantastic. Others? Pesticides. Okay, well, how might one, for example, reduce one's exposure to pesticides? Eat organic. Certainly. Anyone know off the top of their head what food has the highest level of pesticide residues? And I'll give you a hint. It's not strawberries. Worse than grapes. In fact, worse than Chilean imported grapes. Worse than cheese? Worse than celery? Worse than celery. Worse than coffee? Worse than cherries? Meat, indeed. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, vegetarians have only 1-2% to 2 of the level of many pesticides and industrial carcinogens within their bodies. Only 1-2%. to 2 the most powerful known carcinogen in the world is a man-made industrial toxin called dioxin, like Agent Orange. That's a type of dioxin. When you hear about someone referring to toxic waste on TV, they're probably talking about dioxin. And through food alone, non-vegan Americans, meaning Americans the meat, dairy, eggs, are getting 22 times the maximum tolerable exposure set by the EPA for dioxin levels in their diet. So yes, populations across the world, Canada, Germany, here throughout the Europe and the United States, yes, we do get some from cigarette smoke. We do get some from just breathing our air. Can't do much about that. Here in the United States, we don't get a lot from horse meat products, but we do get it all from, if you look here, beef, chicken, pork, cheese, milk, eggs, and fish. The number one source of dioxins in our food supply in the United States. When researchers have actually taken samples from supermarkets across the United States and combined all the really dangerous pesticides and chemicals, PCBs, dioxins, put it all together, this is how much you get in your diet if you eat beef, this is how much if you eat chicken, hot dogs, fish, God forbid, ice cream. This is how much you get if you eat a plant-based or vegan diet. This study looked at the pesticide contaminants in human breast milk depending on the dietary habits of the mothers. They wanted to see those eating meat versus those not eating meat. And you can, as you can read, the lowest levels of DDT, a banned pesticide, dioxins and PCBs were found, of course, in the milk of vegetarians. Nursing infants with non-vegan mothers are getting up to 65 times the maximum tolerable dose of this toxic waste. Now, breast is still best, even when we're exposing our babies to these levels of toxins, but vegan breast milk is better. 
The most prestigious scientific body in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences, recently released a damning report on the amount of dioxins in our food supply. And their number one recommendation was that all Americans need to reduce their consumption of meat. And they meant all meat, even chicken, even fish, even dairy. And the reason is that dioxins are stored in animal fat. And the higher you go up the food chain, the more concentrated these dioxins get. And you say, wait a sec. Americans, we just eat kind of one step up on the food chain, right? We eat plants and we eat plant eaters, herbivores like cows, etc. Why are non-vegan Americans still getting 22 times the maximum tolerable dose of this toxin? Well, for any of you who followed the mad cow disease story here in the United States, you'll know that there are no more herbivores in modern corporate agribusiness. Millions, millions of tons of fat is scraped from the carcasses of livestock and goes straight back in the, into animal feed. And then the fat trimmings from those carcasses gets fed to other animals and the levels of dioxins gets higher and higher. Not only have we made pigs, chickens, cows into meat eaters in this country, but into cannibals as well. Let us take a look at the top of the food chain fast food restaurants and if you can read this in very small type it starts out saying yes dairy products meat and fish are the primary source of environmental exposure to dioxins for the general population but it goes on to say what about fast food no one's ever studied that until this very important landmark study they looked at McDonald's Big Mac compared to Pizza Hut cheese pizza Kentucky Fried Chicken and Hagen dazs ice cream. And they found quite the toxic soup. Even DDT, DDE is how you measure DDT levels in foods, and you'll see this was a pesticide considered so dangerous it was banned decades ago but still exists in our environment. And as you can see, ice cream follows a close second to McDonald's. Big Mac. Wait a second, though. I mean, it's the dose that makes the poison, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if there are hundreds of carcinogens in these foods if there's not enough to actually affect. I mean, do you have to eat like a, a hundred burgers a day to reach any kind of maximum, any kind of tolerable dose? Well, here's actually the data on quantity, which I will turn into graphical form to make it a little more easy. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the maximum tolerable exposure to dioxins for children is 120 femtograms a day. Now, this is less than a trillionth of a gram. This is truly the most toxic substance known to humankind. So 120 is kind of the safety window for our children in terms of daily exposure through diet. Well, so... How much is in these foods? How much is in a McDonald's Big Mac, for example? Is it like 50 femtograms, almost half the tolerable dose? Is it 100, almost a full complement of our allotted allowance for our children? Or in one slice of pizza, this is per serving, one drumstick, one scoop of ice cream? Well, let's look at ice cream, for example. Ice cream has not 100 femtograms, not even 200, but according to the best data we have, ice cream, a single scoop, has not 100, not 200, but up to 49,000 femtograms of dioxins in every single scoop, in every Big Mac, up to 50. 50,000 femtograms. We're talking 400 times the maximum tolerable dose, but not worse than taking our children to KFC or Pizza Hut, where we are indeed exposing them to not 400, but almost 1,000 times the maximum tolerable dose of toxic waste. This is what it's doing to our daughters. This is a landmark study done at Harvard, looked at nearly 100,000 women, and Harvard researchers found that young women eating the most animal fat had significantly greater risk of developing breast cancer. According to this study, those that ate the most red meat and dairy had over 75% 
higher chance of developing breast cancer. Conclusion, animal intake of animal fat, mainly from red meat and high fat dairy foods during premenopausal years is associated indeed with quite an increased risk. That is one of the reasons why breast cancer rates continue to skyrocket every single year, more and more women every year. So, to help you and your family stop cancer, consider eating low on the food chain and the lowest being a plant-based, an entirely plant-based or vegan diet. There are lots of other carcinogens in meat. There are the nitrites in processed meats, giving them that nice bloody pink color. There's heterocyclic amines in grilled and fried meats. In fact, you can actually experimentally demonstrate just how carcinogenic the diets of those that consume meat is. See, the DNA in bacteria is the same DNA that's in plants and people and animals and every other living thing. And so you can estimate just how carcinogenic a chemical is by dripping it on some bacteria in a petri dish and just counting how many DNA mutations it causes. The more mutagenic the chemical is, the highly, higher the likelihood that it causes cancer because it damages or mutates DNA. So... These Swedish researchers took these 20 meat eaters and had them poop in a thermos. Then they took meat out of their diet and had them poop in another thermos. And then they took a few drops of feces from each of these thermoses and dripped them on bacteria in a petri dish. And the feces of those eating meat caused 44% more mutations than those not eating meat. A few weeks later. Researchers have tried the same thing with urine. They had some meat eaters pee on some bacteria, took meat out of their diet for a few weeks, had them pee again, and the urine of those eating meat caused 77% more mutations than those not eating meat. We have yet to look at other bodily fluids. But what the bottom line seems to be is that people who consume meat seem to be just oozing with carcinogens from their diet. Almost all the studies ever done on plant foods have shown protective benefits, and almost all the studies done on animal foods, meat, dairy, and eggs, have shown increased cancer risk. Is it any wonder? There are studies in the medical literature with titles like the cancerostatic effects of vegetarian diets, or the cancer-stopping effects. Is it any wonder that in the longest-running study on vegetarians in history, the California Seventh-day Adventist study, those that ate meat had an 88% higher chance of developing colon cancer, 54% more prostate cancer, not to mention twice the diabetes, twice the high blood pressure, more rheumatoid arthritis, excuse me, etc., etc. And in terms of colon cancer, in this study, it was not just so-called red meat, just like switching from red meat to chicken and fish has shown to be useless in terms of lowering your cholesterol levels. Those eating white meat like chicken just once a week had three times more colon cancer risk, it seemed, than those that stay away from meat altogether. The most comprehensive report on diet and cancer in history was published in 1997. We have an update coming in 2007, but until then, this is the best we have. It looked at every single study ever done on diet and cancer, reviewed over 4,500 studies, took four years to complete, written by the top cancer researchers all around the globe. And after all that work, what was their number one recommendation, their number one conclusion, and I quote, choose a diet that is predominantly plant-based with a variety of fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, and minimally processed starchy foods, meaning whole grains. So, fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, and whole grains, that's what thousands of studies point towards for cancer prevention, a whole foods, vegan, or plant-based diet. In the January issue of Scientific American, it was noted, quote, cancer is most frequent among those branches of the human race where carnivorous habits prevail, unquote. That was the January issue in 1892. This is nothing new. In fact, if that isn't early enough for you, we can go back in time to one of the earliest 
published medical texts in human history back to 1686 and three and a half centuries ago they were writing the same thing. Number one recommendation of the American, cancer, American Institute for Cancer Research? Plant-based diets. Number one recommendation of the World Cancer Research Fund? Plant-based diets. Number one recommendation of the American Cancer Society? More plants, less meat. Number one recommendation of the World Health Organization? More fruits and vegetables. Now, the beef industry disagrees. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association criticized the American Cancer Society guidelines as being, quote, decidedly unfriendly to beef. Unquote. Of course, you must remember as recently as 1994, chief executives of another industry, seven major cigarette corporations, testified under oath that they did not believe nicotine to be addictive, nor that cigarette smoking had anything to do with lung cancer. In much the same way, the meat industry continues to deny that their products have anything to do with our cancer epidemic. Even if you are vegetarian, though, even if you're vegan, none of us can completely eliminate step one of cancer development, exposure to carcinogens, because we have so poisoned our world. It's in our air, it's in our water, it's in our soil. We are surrounded by things like diesel fumes, the hole in our ozone layer, vinyl chloride, a gas emitted by PVC plastic, otherwise known as new car smell, radioactive fallout from nuclear bomb testing has caused cancer in an estimated 80,000 Americans since 1951. We just breathe it in, kind of comes down in the rain. Right. The bottom line is that, yes, we can reduce our exposure to carcinogens, but we can't completely eliminate exposure, particularly in the world we've created. But, you know, even in a perfect world, there are natural carcinogens in plants, like tobacco is, after all, a plant. But even in whole healthy plant foods, there are tiny amounts of natural carcinogens. But our bodies have evolved ways to deal with them. Our bodies has an ingenious array of ways for dealing with ingested carcinogens. Our liver, for example, deactivates carcinogens. All the blood from our digestive tract, our stomach, our intestines, all, before it goes to the rest of the body, first goes straight through the liver. And our liver has enzymes that neutralize carcinogens. Isn't our body totally amazing? And uh, the scientific community just discovered a new way to boost our liver's ability to destroy carcinogens, and that way is called broccoli. Plants are storehouses of thousands of phytonutrients. These so-called phytonutrients, phyto means plant. These are special plant chemicals found only in the plant kingdom. I like to think of them as phytonutrients because they fight cancer and fight aging, little phytonutrients. But there's one type of phytonutrient, isn't even on the graph here, this extends very far out, called the glucosinolate. And these glucosinolates boost our liver's ability to destroy carcinogens. And they're only found in one plant family, the cabbage family. So that means our greens, collard greens, bok choy, beet greens, arugula, char, kale, watercress, turnip greens, mustard greens, 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 or cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, any of these. See, not all fruits and vegetables are alike. Take, say, bladder cancer, for example. Eating fruit does not seem to prevent bladder cancer. Vegetables in general, nothing. Green vegetables in general, nothing. But those eating just a single serving of cruciferous vegetables every day, these vegetables I've been talking about, cut their risk of bladder cancer in half. Why? Because these vegetables boosted our liver's ability to destroy carcinogens before they ever made it down into the bladder. Broccoli helps your body take out the trash. And we're not just talking about bladder cancer here. Studies suggest that eating greens could cut your total cancer risk in half. In half. Greens every day. The single healthiest thing on the planet. So to stop cancer, eat your greens, which we will put down as superfood number one. 
So in terms of blocking cancer at step one, first we have to minimize the amount of carcinogens we do eat, choose organic, choose vegan whenever you can, and then to deal with any ingested carcinogens we do ingest, we need to eat our greens. Step two. We need to block the carcinogens' ability to damage or mutate our DNA. We cannot help but eat some carcinogens, so the least we can do is move them along. That's where fiber comes in, right? I mean, yes, our liver does destroy carcinogens. First, they have to get to the liver through our intestine, increasing our risk of colorectal or intestinal cancer. Right? And indeed, fiber is only found in one place, and that's the plant kingdom. Animals have bones to hold them up. Plants have fiber to hold them up. So while animal foods have a monopoly on cholesterol, plant foods have a monopoly on fiber. But only really unrefined plant foods, when you mill whole wheat into white flour, for example, not only do you get rid of the fiber and many of the vitamins and minerals, but there's up to a 25,000% decrement in phytonutrient content. So, for example, take oral cancer, a truly horrific cancer. Those that eat whole grains every day, cut their risk of developing oral cancer in half. How much reduction of risk do people get if they just eat refined grains, white bread and bagels every day? Any guesses? How much reduction of risk? Not only do you get zero, but you actually increase your risk 600%. You eat whole grains every day, you cut your risk in half. You just eat refined grains every day, you multiply your risk times six. I'd like to single out one whole grain in particular for our purposes here, and that's oats. Oats have these special phytonutrients, the special soluble fiber called beta-glucan, which not only reduces your cancer risk, but lowers your triglycerides, uh, your blood sugar, and your cholesterol. So that will, oats will go down as superfood number two. We should eat the grain, the whole grain, and nothing but the whole grain. You know, even if we never ate any carcinogens, though, our body naturally produces internal carcinogens called free radicals, which attack our DNA and can initiate cancer. Now, many of us have heard of terms like free radicals or antioxidants, but, you know, how many people really think they know exactly what they are? I mean, I was a biophysics major, still took me forever to figure out. I will do my best to explain everyone ready for a lesson in the quantum biology of oxidative phosphorylation in four minutes? Okay. Plants get their energy from the sun. Everybody with me so far? You take a leaf, you put it on the sun in a process called photosynthesis. It stores up energy of the sun and transfers that energy to tiny building blocks of nature called electrons. So the plants start out with low energy electrons and then charges them up with energy from the sun into high energy electrons. In this way, plants store the energy of the sun in the form of high energy electrons. We then eat these electrons in the form of carbs, protein, fat, and transfer these electrons to all of our cells, which use them as a fuel source, as a source of fuel. Now, this has to be done in a very tightly controlled manner in terms of our cells using these high-energy electrons as a fuel source, slowly releasing their energy because these electrons are just packed with energy. In fact, they're like gasoline. In fact, what is gasoline? What is petroleum? What is charcoal? Right? They don't call them fossil fuels for nothing. This is just prehistoric plant matter which stored up the energy of the sun which shined millions of years ago, which we now use to put in our SUVs. Just like it would be dangerous to throw a lit match into a jug of gasoline, it's dangerous for our bodies to release all this energy at once from these high-energy electrons. So our body takes these high-energy electrons and slowly releases their energy just a bit at a time, like a gas stove, a teeny bit at a time, until all the energy is used up. Then it takes these spent or used up electrons and transfers them to an all-important molecule you may have heard about called oxygen. 
That's why we need to breathe. We need a place to put these used up electrons. In fact, that's the way toxins like cyanide kill us as they prevent our body from giving these used up electrons to oxygen. And oxygen just loves electrons. There's one thing about oxygen is just crazy about electrons. So while our body is taking its sweet old time slowly releasing the electrons energy, the oxygen is like waiting at the end of the line, tapping its foot all impatient. would love to get its grubby little hands on one of those high energy electrons, but the body's like, slow down, take your time. We'll give you your electron, but only after we've used up all the energy so it's safe to play with. And that oxygen molecule's all huffy and be like, oh, I can handle one of those high energy electrons any day. And then, out of the corner of its eye, it sees one of these high energy electrons just sitting out there in the open. See, our body can't keep an eye on oxygen all the time. Between 1 to 2% of all the high energy electrons that pass through our body leak out of our cells and oxygen just pounces on them. And once oxygen gets its hand on one of these high energy electrons, it like turns into the Hulk. It turns from lowly oxygen into what's called superoxide, which is a type of free radical. And once that oxygen has its hand on that high energy electron, turns into superoxide, it is just wired with energy, starts smashing around the cell, knocking stuff over, tripping over DNA, damaging our DNA. Now we can't have that. So our body calls in the antioxidants, which arrive at the scene and say, drop that electron. And our free radicals like, you want a piece of me, Mr. Vitamin C? Come on. And the antioxidants jump on the superoxide, wrestle the electron away from it, and alas, we are left with poor oxygen. Ripped genes, never meant to hurt anyone. In scientific circles, this process, this phenomenon which oxygen molecules grab onto stray electrons and go crazy is what's called oxidant stress. And the leading theory is on aging is that this cellular damage caused by free radicals is what basically causes aging. Like the brown age spots at the back of our hand, that's just oxidized fat under our skin. Oxidant stress is the reason we get wrinkles, the reason we lose some of our memory, the reason our organ systems break down as we get older, our cells have just accumulated so much DNA damage, they just can't repair themselves properly. Basically, we're rusting. That's what rust is. The oxidation of metal and aging and disease can be thought of as the oxidation of our bodies. The oxidant stress theory is this. Free radicals cause the tissue damage which leads to a whole array of health challenges. Contributing from everything, from heart disease to Alzheimer's, cataracts, etc. Basically, almost every disease you can mention. So, but we can block this first step with the superheroes and the heroines of the body, the antioxidants. Does that mean the same foods that prevent cancer also prevent heart disease? Yes, and now you know why. Scientists are starting to think of these diseases as antioxidant deficiency diseases, which is basically the same thing as calling them fruit and vegetable deficiency diseases. So we can stop cancer at step two. We can prevent the DNA damage by making sure we're constantly flooding our body with antioxidants. Now, where are we going to get them from? A pill bottle? Don't the drug companies wish... Right? They can't patent a carrot, make a million dollars off it, although they're trying. Right? So the drug company sat down and said, well, we know fruits and vegetables prevent cancer. I bet it's that beta carotene stuff. So they gave thousands of people beta carotene pills, beta carotene supplements, see if it prevented cancer. It didn't work. There are over 500 carotenoids, over 500 carotenes, from alpha carotene through zeta carotene and beyond. They just gave beta and expected it to do something? So they tried vitamin C supplements, didn't work. Vitamin E supplements, they just cannot find the right mixture. Centrum, for example, just added lutein to their daily multivitamin. Lutein is this wonderful phytonutrient found in dark green leafy vegetables, helps your eyes for eye health. If you look on the back here, every single pill of Centrum has 250 micrograms of lutein. Well, this single leaf of collard greens has over 10,000. 
Popeye was right. Eat your grains. According to Harvard's study of over 100,000 people, if all you do is eat a single measly serving of dark green leafy vegetables a day, not only will you cut your cancer risk, you'll cut your risk of having a stroke by 20%, cut your risk of having a heart attack by 25%. We're not talking about cutting out meat. We're just talking adding a single serving, like a half cup of broccoli, to your daily diet every day, cut your risk of heart disease, number one killer in the United States, by 25%. Wait a second, cancer, heart disease, stroke, aren't those the top three killers in the United States? Yes, and you get all that protection wrapped up into one when you eat your greens. The only side effect is you might get a little piece of green stuck in your teeth, and it's all embarrassing. But that's it. Imagine if there were a pill that could cut your heart disease risk 25% and only had good side effects. Everyone would be taking it. Be making billions of dollars for some drug company, right? But when that pill is eat some darn broccoli, people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know whole fruits and vegetables work. They're cheap. Why don't doctors prescribe them? Doctors should be whipping out their prescription pads and writing broccoli, one cup a day, unlimited refills. So dump veggies on everything, no longer. Should anyone in this room ever have spaghetti with marinara sauce? They should have spaghetti with marinara sauce with lots of vegetables dumped on top. Never again a bean burrito, but a bean burrito with lots of vegetables stuffed inside. The World Health Organization blames low fruit and vegetable consumption on literally millions of deaths worldwide. We should all be eating fruits and vegetables as if our lives depended on it because guess what? They do. Who can tell me what the minimum recommended daily servings of number of fruits and vegetables we're supposed to have every day? Anybody? Five a day, right? Well, it used to be five a day. The minimum federal recommendation is now up to nine a day, nine to 13, nine minimum. Thought you weren't doing so good before, now you're really behind. Well, wait a second. Why haven't many of us heard about this change from five a day to nine a day? Well, don't expect to hear about it anytime soon. Our federal government spends about $10 million a year on educating Americans about healthy eating habits. That's how much McDonald's spends every 48 hours on advertising. That's less than a single candy company spends advertising one brand, one brand of chewing gum every year. You will never see ads on TV for this, one of the healthiest things on the planet. You'll just see ads for junk, right? Because this doesn't have any profit margin. So you can understand why you wouldn't see ads for this on, you know, kind of the corporate media. But, I mean, why hasn't your doctor been telling you all this? Well, because odds are your doctor never learned any of this. Less than a quarter of medical schools have a single course on nutrition to this day. On average, according to a Senate subcommittee report, your doctor probably got four hours of nutrition training out of thousands of hours of preclinical instruction, four hours. In fact, there's even a study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, a head-to-head test of nutrition knowledge, doctors versus patients. Guess who won? Patients, right? People off the street know more nutrition than their doctors, yeah? And we all know how much people off the street know about nutrition. Yet people continue to go to their doctors for advice on healthy eating habits, and what their doctors are telling them is killing them. It was not too long ago that doctors recommended pregnant women smoke cigarettes to deal with morning sickness. Until doctors learn more about nutrition, their advising you about your diet is physician-assisted suicide. There is one doctor, though, everybody trusts, Dr. Benjamin Spock. 
always on the leading edge of every important social movement, in the final edition of his book, the best-selling book in American history, second only to the Bible, he recommended that all children be raised vegan with zero exposure to dairy and meat. Why? To prevent cancer and other chronic degenerative diseases. Okay, so we need to be flooding our body with antioxidants every day. Where are we going to get them from? Fruits and vegetables. Are there some fruits and vegetables that are better than others? Yes, indeed. So, for example, Tufts University, my alma mater, bought, did a study of 40 common fruits and vegetables a few years ago. The study results got a little press. Anyone remember which food out came out number one in terms of antioxidant power? Anybody? No? Blueberries. Excellent. Blueberries came out number one. In fact, the top four were blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, and raspberries. So berries go down as superfood number three. Studies suggest that eating berries every day could add an entire healthy year onto your life. Just like that. Right? Wait a second. Years onto your life and it's delicious. That's what eating a plant-based diet is all about. The vegetable that won the heavyweight title for antioxidant champion of the year was... Broccoli came in number five. Any other guesses? Carrots didn't even make the top five. Kale came in number one. Yes, indeed. In fact, the top five kale, spinach, Brussels sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and broccoli, kale, all hail kale, one of the few vegetables that can actually kick broccolis. But Benjamin Franklin was actually credited for bringing the first kale seeds over from Scotland. Smart man. Here are the top five. Notice many of these are the cruciferous vegetables. So not only will they boost your liver's ability to destroy carcinogens, but they are just packed to the hilt with antioxidants to deal with any carcinogens that manage to get by. Now contrast this list <clears throat> excuse me, with America's favorite vegetable, the French fry, freedom fry, excuse me, and America's second favorite vegetable, iceberg lettuce, of course. Just like the USDA made a mistake in telling people to eat grains and didn't specify whole grains, they made a mistake by just saying eat fruits and vegetables and not specifying the healthiest ones. And the healthiest ones are the ones with the brightest colors. Scientists are discovering more and more about the health benefits associated with the actual plant pigments themselves, which make fruits and vegetables such vibrant colors, like beta carotene, makes fruits and vegetables yellow and orange. Two years ago, Harvard study 47,000 men found that men who ate just 10 servings of tomato products every week cut the risk of developing aggressive prostate cancer in half. Why? Cutting your prostate risk in half by eating tomato sauce. Why? Because of lycopene, the red pigment that makes tomatoes red, watermelon red, pink grapefruits pink. Now we're finding more and more about anthocyanin, and the stuff that makes blueberries blue. Right? The colors themselves are the antioxidants. The anti-cancer properties of blueberries literally come out of the blue. And that knowledge alone should revolutionize your trip down the produce aisle. What's healthier? Red onions or white onions? Red onions. Very good. Pink grapefruit or regular grapefruit? Pink grapefruit. Very good. All right. Purple grape juice, white grape juice? Purple. Very good. Yellow corn or white corn? What about candy corn? <laughs> what? It's colorful. Butternut squash, yellow on the inside, or summer squash, white on the inside? Butternut squash, indeed. White chocolate or dark chocolate? Dark chocolate, absolutely. See, you don't need me to go to the grocery store with you. You can make all these calls yourself. Iceberg lettuce or romaine lettuce? <clears throat> you know, you eat an entire head of iceberg lettuce, 
and you get 10% of your RDA for nothing. So, shop for the reddest of strawberries, the blackest of blackberries, the most scarlet tomato, the darkest green broccoli you can find because the colors themselves are the anti-aging, anti-cancer, antioxidants. Red cabbage, for example, has 10 times more antioxidants than green cabbage. Uh, Granny Smith are red delicious. Red delicious. Purple skinned eggplant, white skinned eggplant. Well, only if you eat the skin, right? Because where's the color found in the skin? You chop an eggplant open, there's nothing in there. Which brings us to an important point. Where is most of the nutrition of this apple found? In the skin, absolutely. Apples have some wonderful antioxidants like quercetin, but they're almost all found in the peel. Look at inside, there's nothing in there. The rest of the apple is basically water, sugar, and air. Air is why they float at Halloween, right? <laughs> Apple juice, which makes up half the fruit servings of preschoolers in the United States, is basically just sugar water. Doesn't even have any vitamin C in it. Why? Because they don't use the peel in its production. The way you can tell if a fruit has a lot of antioxidants in it, has a lot of vitamin C in it, is you cut it open, expose it to air, and see if it oxidizes, see if it turns brown, right? Now, you, ex you, you cut open America's two favorite fruits, apples, bananas, what happens? Turns brown right away, right? But how do you keep your fruit salad from turning brown? Lemon juice, right? You drip the lemon juice on what's in the lemon juice? Vitamin C. The citrus juice has vitamin C. And vitamin C acts as an antioxidant, keeping the fruit from turning brown, from oxidizing, can do the exact same thing within your body. Cut open a mango, what happens? Nothing. Doesn't turn brown. Why? Because look at it inside. It is just packed with antioxidants. Look at that color. And this is not just in theory. You take a peeled apple, put it in a blender, drip some of that juice on human liver cancer cells. You can actually slow down the cancer growth rate a little bit, but you take a whole apple. You put it in a blender, you drip some of that juice on human liver cancer cells, and you, and you slow down their cancer growth rate over 90%. So if you have a choice, don't peel your fruits and vegetables. And this is actually old data. This wimpy, tough study of 40 common fruits and vegetables has since been superseded by this very important study called a systematic screening of total antioxidants in dietary plants. Looked at over 300 different plants, and our champions have been toppled. New top 10, walnuts. Pomegranates, sunflower seeds, blackberries, cranberries, ginger, blueberries, dried apricots, raspberries, and prunes. So much for my dark green leafies. And look, blueberries got their little blue butts kicked down to number seven. Now this is for cultivated blueberries. Wild blueberries actually belong up here between two and three. Same thing with wild raspberries, wild strawberries. See, people... Some people don't like to eat vegetables, and the feeling is mutual. They don't want you eating them either, so they produce these bitter compounds to make themselves less tasty. But many of these bitter compounds are actually the, the phytonutrients that prevent cancer, like the glucosinolates in broccoli. The more bitter your Brussels sprout is, the healthier it is. So instead of trying to breed the bitterness out like our food industry tries to do, we just need to find ways to prepare it, sauces, etc., to make it irresistibly delicious. And this is actually the reason we think why organic produce has up to 58% more antioxidants than conventionally grown produce. See, because the more plants are munched on by bugs, the more, as a defense mechanism, these bitter compounds they release to prevent the bugs from eating them. But pesticide-laden plants don't get bitten a lot by bugs and therefore don't have to produce many of these cancer-fighting compounds. And this is old data. Just when we thought blueberries were the winner, someone looked at walnuts, and just when walnuts were getting cocky, 
someone looked at herbs and spices, which almost all blow walnuts out of the water. We're now learning that a lot of the flavor compounds in fruits and vegetables are are powerful antioxidants as well. The flavors themselves are the antioxidants. So there's these compounds called gingerols. Guess where they're found? Right? Don't forget rosmarinic acid. Right? So for maximum nutrition, we should, we should eat both colorful and flavorful foods. According to the study, the top antioxidant fresh herb is, any guesses? Parsley doesn't even make the list. Oh, I heard it back there. Any gardeners out there? Not basil, but oregano. Oregano, then sage, peppermint, thyme. Oregano has 40 times more antioxidants than blueberries and about 1,000 times more than almost everything that Americans eat. And we say, you know what that means, don't you? Dark green leafies back on top. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but wait a second. Aren't fresh herbs expensive? Not if you grow your own. Oregano's a weed. We'll take over your entire backyard. You're going to have to mow it to keep it down. You can harvest hundreds of dollars worth of fresh oregano every single year. Um, uh, top antioxidant spices. Cloves, actually by a long shot, allspice, and cinnamon. Now, just to put this all on the same scale, this is oregano compared to walnuts, compared to blueberries, compared to everything, basically, that typical Americans eat. Right? See, because this is on a gram, but this is on a gram per gram per weight basis, right? So, you know, you can eat a whole ounce of walnuts, one little handful, right? But eating a whole ounce of cloves, not so easy. In fact, cloves, I couldn't even fit, is on like the fourth floor over here, right? But, you know, it's on a per weight basis. So, you can imagine how just a teeny pinch of dried spices like cinnamon added to your oatmeal in the morning or anything throughout the day could add so much antioxidant power to your daily meals um, and fresh herbs are just miraculous. So we should be eating both colorful and flavorful foods. Anyone think of a spice that's particularly colorful and flavorful? Turmeric, absolutely. With that which makes curry powder yellow just last year, researchers at Texas A&M University basically just sprinkled some turmeric on human blood cancer cells, human leukemia cells, and basically these cells stopped growing, stopped replicating, stopped dead in their tracks. So we should all continue to curry favor with our body. <clears throat> there are also important compounds, flavor compounds in garlic and onions. Garlic is actually the earliest known plant-based remedy for cancer. The ancient Egyptians were using garlic to treat cancer over 3,500 years ago. Well, now, 3,500 years later, new study just out of Japan, those that ate 10 grams of allium family vegetables a day, right? Scallions, hives, leeks, etc., garlic, onions, just 10 grams a day cut the risk of prostate cancer in half. Now that is three, three cloves of garlic a day or just one tablespoon of chopped onions a day. You cut your risk of prostate cancer in half. This is how we think garlic works. Every cell in our body is equipped with a fail-safe mechanism to prevent cancer called programmed cell death. If a cell builds up too many mutations, if its, if its DNA is damaged beyond repair, the cell literally commits suicide to prevent itself from turning cancerous. Isn't that just amazing? Here's a, a photograph of it actually happening. I'm taken under a microscope. This is a normal cell. This is a cell that basically just blew itself up. Here, right here, is a cell that thought it might be turning cancerous and so like jumped on a grenade to protect the rest of the body. Cancer cells don't die, though. We have cancer cell lines growing from people that died decades ago. 
Why? Because these cancer cells somehow found a way to turn off the self-destruct mechanism. That's where garlic comes in. Garlic somehow seems to reprogram in the self-destruct. You drip some garlic extract on human liver cancer cells, human colon cancer cells, human skin cancer, and all of a sudden these cells look at themselves in the mirror, realize just how horribly mutated they are, and kill themselves right on the spot. So let us add garlic to the list. Same thing happens when you drip orange juice on breast cancer cells. There are unique phytonutrients in the citrus family with unique names like tangerine or lemonoids like lemonine. These antioxidant scientists don't seem a real creative bunch. But you know, most of the lemonine is actually found in the white and pulp of the fruit, so it's much better to eat an orange than it is to just drink orange juice. But you know, most of the lemonine is actually found in the peel, in the colored part of the rind. So we need to zest. We need to start putting lemon zest, orange zest, lime zest into the foods that we make. Or we can just eat kumquats. Right? These little citrus fruits which you can eat, peel and all, making them the healthiest citrus fruits out there. So we need to rein these renegade cancer cells in by reminding them of their original fail-safe programming by eating members of the garlic family and members of the citrus family. And looking at my watch, due to time constraints, I'm unfortunately going to have to stop there. And you say, well, wait a second. What about the other two cancer development steps? What about the other eight? Oh, other eight of the top ten Top 12 cancer-fighting foods, that's what handouts are for. Handouts are available on my website, and so my website is drgregor.org. Um, and so the handout that you can download off the website, PDF, has all the lists of all the top cancer-fighting foods and the antioxidant lists and the most pesticide-contaminated fruits and vegetables and all sorts of great material. I have this entire lecture on DVD. This goes on for a couple hours because it's a very long talk, and it has all the various stages of cancer prevention here. I also, my latest book just came out two months ago in February, Carbophobia, the Scary Truth on America's Low Carb Craze. If anyone knows, anyone on low carb diets, I've got a gift idea for them. <clears throat> all the money I receive from all the sales of my videos, DVDs, books, all goes to charity, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greger. That was uh, wonderful. Thank you again for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.